Okay, welcome to the Actor and the Engineer podcast. My name is Paul James. I come from the acting background. And I'm Josh Knapp. I'm a broadcast engineer. Here we go. All right, today we're going to talk about all of the best actor award winners and then probably some nominees too, maybe some missed nominations or missed wins. Yeah, so this completes Best Supporting Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Best Actress, and Best Actor now. We've talked about all those. And now we've decided that we're going to do Best Directors and then not do a Best Picture. We're going to talk about our favorite films of 2014 for the Best Picture category of this group. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, because, I mean, we can go through Best Picture... Partially, like, I want to see some more best pictures because I think that's one where, I mean, performances and all that aside, I mean, I would like to see more of these movies. But if, if, there's, a, if there's something that the Academy has said that this is the best that the industry has had to offer for in whatever criteria, then, I mean, that, that's something that needs to be, I think, at least need, I need to look at. Like, oh, absolutely. Even things like that I might not even be interested in, like Gandhi, you know? Like, really? You've never yeah, seen it? I've never seen it. Oh, you should see so, it. So, yeah, exactly. And so... What about things yeah. like Chicago? Oh, I mean, I saw it, but oh, okay. it didn't seem... I saw it in the theater with Steph. Okay. We, we were newly married. Was that 03, I think? Somewhere around there, yeah. 03. Yeah. So we were fairly newly fairly newly married, and <laughs> if that's the word. Sure. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we went to the theater, and that was... I mean, she was excited about that. I think she may have seen it in the theater. Theater. Was it a theater thing before? Oh, yeah, okay, absolutely. Good. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, big one. So I think she may have seen it in the theater before, and so she was really excited about it. And, and I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, it, it, it was it was good. I, I enjoy uh, musicals in, in general. See, I didn't think that about. I wasn't expecting that from you, because you mentioned Moulin Rouge once, and I was like, what? Wait. Oh, yeah, I really do yeah. like Moulin yeah. Rouge. Yeah, well, you like film. So this is a genre of film that's important, and it's hard to to watch a person just burst out into singing, Mm -hmm. but when into song, but when it's done right, your, your suspension of disbelief is just washed away for whatever reason. When you see it live on stage, it's easier to accept Mm -hmm. and it seems to work better on stage. And there's something about being there with the live vocal. It's like the difference when we're talking about whiplash, hearing a drum in a movie versus hearing a drum in real life or going to a concert. So Yeah. yeah. Well, but I mean, and also it's, it's easier to suspend disbelief in a theater because you've got a back, drop that's not real even yeah you or you've got even if you have a kitchen like in birdman they've got a kitchen set but it's a set you can look on one side or the other and you're like well it's not a real room so that right there you're already buying into it right so if somebody bursts into song you're like well i've already bought into this fake kitchen thing so yeah your imagination Let's, fills in the blank that's why a chair yeah. on stage alone can be a thousand different things because your mind takes over yeah but yeah. when you're shooting film it yeah. 8K and you're, yeah. you know, I mean, you've got perfect sets. It's kind of like, well, I mean, that maybe I could see it being harder for that. So, all right. So we'll, I'm going to hand the reins over to you. Go for it. All right. So what, what I did was I went through the whole list of best actor winners and looked at all the nominations and then wrote down a few that, you know, stuck out to me. It's not really a top five list or a top 10 list of best actors. It's just performances that were honored with the Academy Award that I need to make mention of, like we did with Best Actress and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, the first one is not until 1940. So how many years is that? That's uh, 11 years, 1929. Yeah, because they, they did the combining ones uh, yes, but starting since, in 27. But since the Oscars started and they were giving out Best Actor, it was 1929 to 1940, right? So that's 11 years, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it took me 11 years to say this performance stuck out for me because I haven't seen a lot of the first 11 years of the Best Actor Oscars. But after that, it's... I have seen a lot of these films. Oh, that's great. Yeah, a lot. And I was surprised. And I'm always surprised that I've seen as many as I did. I did it for the best actors, too. I was like, wait, I'm not going to be able to talk about a lot of these. I haven't seen a lot of them. It was like, nope, I've seen that. Nope, I've seen that. Nope, I've seen that. But the first one is Jimmy Stewart in The Philadelphia Story. Mm -hmm. We have talked about this. We have talked about it in a couple of different podcasts. I just recently saw it a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about what we recently saw, we recently mm-hmm. watched. And 
this is a much debated performance because there is the debate whether or not he's the supporting character or is he, he's the lead character. And a lot of people, and people I know who know the Oscars well, are of the mindset that this is an Oscar because he lost the year before for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Mm -hmm. I am in disagreement with all of that. I mm -hmm. think it's the lead character. No doubt in my mind he's the lead character. Even though the last time I saw it, I was like, wait, is he the supporting character? He is, I think he's more interesting in this film than he is in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Now, I know a lot of people whose buttons just got pushed. <laughs> a lot. One of my buddies in New York, he's, he's probably going to call me. He's like, what? <laughs> he thinks he deserved it for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He's, he's a huge Jimmy Stewart fan. He mm -hmm. bought Jimmy Stewart's childhood bed. Wow. Yeah. My sure. buddy has, yeah. Yeah, his wife was like, you want to pay how much for what? <laughs> oh, no. And he was like, but I want it. Don't get him in trouble again. Come yeah. On. <laughs> now, no, apparently she, you know, she was like, you've supported us really well. You're a great husband. You're a great father. You make a lot of money. So, so go, go play with your it. toys. So wow. that's in his, his den. Anyway, so this is an often debated performance. For me, the bottom line in this performance is when he's drunk. He is charming and witty and sophisticated, but he's intoxicated. And that's hard to pull off, especially in a borderline farcical comedy that this is. You mm -hmm. know, it's sort of a pratfall comedy on some levels, you know, especially in the beginning when Cary Grant pushes her down. Yep. I love that. <laughs> it's so great. I keep forgetting every time he balls up his fist at her like he's I'm gonna hit you and then he's like I can't hit you because you're a woman and he pushes her down <laughs> I love that but then Jimmy Stewart comes in and balances the equation mm -hmm. and we talked about this when uh, I just recently saw it that you know when he goes over to Cary Grant's house in the middle of the night I think it's like four o'clock in the morning and he's like I gotta talk to you I think the guy's name Cary Grant's character's name is CK I believe I can't remember mm -hmm. and he's like CK I gotta talk to you and the way that he can articulate his thoughts even though he's intoxicated and been up all night is very comical has great timing it's sophisticated and then when at the end spoiler she does not accept his proposal if you when you rewatch it, look at the sadness in his face. It's so kind of oh, but he she's not meant to be with you. Everybody who's watches watching this movie knows that. But you just feel so bad for him. You're like, oh, he's such a great guy. Mm. He sort of starts off kind of jerky and turns into this really great guy. So 1940, Jimmy Stewart. You've seen Philadelphia Story. I have seen Philadelphia Story. I mean, I you know, like you said, we've talked about it. In, in the past, and I've seen it fairly recently again. I mean, we, we own it, and I'll, I'll put it in every once in a while, maybe once every year or two years. Oh, but, that's cool. Uh, and and Steph kind of likes it, but but it's not. <laughs> she, she'll she stick stick with me on some of those movies, but she does get kind of annoyed with uh, the... I, I, watch, I watch the other Jimmy Stewart... Uh, uh, no, not Jimmy Stewart. The other Car Cary Grant, uh, Catherine Hepburn movie, Bringing a Baby a Lot More. I'll watch that at least once a year. She but doesn't like that? She doesn't like it. I don't know. I guess it's just the, the, the you know, whatever. <laughs> huh, interesting. It's, yeah. She doesn't, th there's certain things that she doesn't like, and, and it's an interesting uh, look into my taste versus possibly what a more, or our taste probably, versus what a, possibly a more like, uh, general, you know, uh, grazer of media would have because she's not, she's not tied into, you know, movies and TV shows and stuff like that, like like we are. Right. So she'll kind of like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll, I'll watch that for a little while. But there's things like The Office. I was watching the off the original British Office. Like I loved it, and it was something that was just kind of like, you know, have you seen the original? No, I okay. haven't. I mean, really, the first episode of the American Office is exactly the same as the first episode yeah, of I've the heard original that. Office. So that right there is you can get a, a better better idea. And they went in different directions. But anyway, so that to, she she just hated it. Like she watched it for five minutes. She just hated it. And so that whole thing is I'm getting off topic. I no, guess. I get but what you're saying. What I'm saying is that yeah. So so we so these types of movies like 
I, I only watch every once in a while. Even the Philadelphia store has some certain, certain scenes similar to, you know, bringing up baby. It's not as slapsticky as bringing up baby is, but, but it is definitely a comedy though. And, and I think that he does, he does well in, in this role. And I can't really, you know, have you seen anything. Mr. Smith goes to Washington? No, I haven't. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's very, um, it has, it's very over the top moments and like very emotional by the, at the well, end. Well, yeah, he's not yielding the floor in Congress until he get. He's what? It, what do you call it? Filibustering. Yes, of course. And I will not yield. And it's really Jimmy Stewart over the top. And um, I actually like his performance in "It's a Wonderful Life" more, even though you really can't compare performances. Mm -hmm. They are what they are for this particular movie. But for me, this movie, Philadelphia Story, showed a side of Jimmy Stewart we hadn't seen before or after. You know, you don't see this whole swab sophisticated. You do, but you don't. For me personally, I'm glad he won the Oscar for this one. Even though people think it's, you know, yeah. it's a, what do they call it? Um, a career Oscar yeah. and or um, a makeup Oscar for the year before. Anyway, right. enough said about that. All right. I, I don't really have one for a while. Um, but, I mean, it seems like throughout the 40s, it's it's kind of big names: Gary Cooper, James, Jimmy Cagney, Bing Crosby. I mean, do, seen do it, you, seen it, seen it. Yeah. Do you have? So, do they deserve that? You think? Well, yeah. Or were they I, good performances. Um, well, the first one, Gary Cooper, is that um, Sergeant York? Yeah. Who so played Alvin York? Um, yeah, I, I thought he was great. Mm -hmm. It's one of those performances where you watch it, and if you didn't know, you would go, "Boy, he should have won the Oscar." Mm, okay. and, and, and he did. And then what was the other one? Um, it was Cagney for Yankee Doodle Dandy. That is a crazy performance. Have you seen that movie? Mm -hmm. Dude, that guy is crazy. He, <laughs> oh my, he come, he's this performer, actor, um, and I don't know if it's based on a real life person. I feel bad with my ignorance to that, but mm -hmm. I think it's a performing family and he's this very driven actor who's very focused but he is very ambition bites the nails of success is a line from a song that i like and mm -hmm. he really is get out of my way i'm going to broadway get out of my way i'm going to be famous get out of my way i'm going to be i mean you see the yankee doodle dandy song you think this is this fun loving character he yeah. is relentless in this movie so yes well deserved what was the third one uh it was uh bing crosby for going my way yeah i like it I, it's a little simplistic for me. Um, it's not. It's got its complications, but um, overall, I, I, do I think it's because they were famous? That's why they won the Oscar. Sure, that's part of it. It's part of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the debate whether or not Cher should have won over Holly Hunter. Was she the most popular vote that year? Probably. Did she deserve it? Absolutely. So I stand my ground with this too. Yeah. All right. And then uh, Ray Milland, uh, Milland. Uh, for the last weekend, did you see that? Yes. Okay. Oh, oh I, I read about this. Are you? We talked about this. Yes. It's it's a, a drunk, basically, right? Yes. He's horrible. Like wow. he's, you feel so bad for him that he is such a drinker. Like in Leaving Las Vegas, you don't feel that bad for Nicolas Cage. You almost go, dude finish yourself off like that I mean but that's his For plan well that's sake. his plan that's his yeah. plan he wants to drink himself to death he makes mm -hmm. that very clear in the very beginning of the film this one you don't feel sympathetic because he's out of control you just feel sympathetic that human beings can lose control and is it a over-the-top drunkard performance that mm -hmm. garnishes um oscar buzz and oscar uh and awards, yes, it is, but it is really deep and in depth. And I feel like I need to take a shower after I watch this movie because he's so, he's so lost. He's wow. so, yeah, it's a it, it. Out of all the ones that we just talked about, mm -hmm. that's the one you should see okay. if you if you you know Netflix or something like that. Yeah, that's well, and I'm already I'm already predisposed to him because I maybe my favorite uh, Hitchcock movie is Dial In for Murder. And he's in that with Grace Kelly, and he is just in in the same way that he he's sounds nothing like, drunk, like this. But in he's this. so just like cold, <sighs> and just you know, this moves to this moves to that, and and the way that he deals with his old friend from college, who, right. who he brings in to yeah. sell a car to that that scene that scene's probably the best scene for me. How it how it 
expands. But so I can see how he's how he's doing that, how he's making this character come to life in Talent for Murder, going kind of the other way to this out of control. And it's not it's 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 like everything you've seen about an alcoholic, but nothing that you've seen. And I think it's one of the first of its kind too. I hmm. think. I'm I'm not sure I'd have to look it up, but I think it's one of the first, because people with drug addictions and alcoholic issues and uh, abuse issues are very um, noticeable performances for obvious reasons, but it's also can be so overplayed that it's not believable. He holds it tight really it's called the lost weekend of course but he is such a lost soul that you feel so bad for him you're like Mm. give the guy a drink just give it to him (laughs) you feel so bad so yeah so what stuck out for you next um i mean it's we're into the 50s now for me so i don't i didn't want to step on the next stuff no that's okay the next one that uh that i wrote down on my list was humphrey bogart uh for the african queen yet another semi if there's a controversy if you will you know it's the oscars you know as superficial as things can get if you look at it in that light but there's a bit of a controversy over this because people thought this was a career oscar also Mm -hmm. they thought he should have uh won for treasure of the sierra madre i love which he was never even nominated for we've talked about that before um which is mind-boggling but john houston's dad won though right yes okay and it won best um no, screenplay, Hamlet won Best Picture, and mm-hmm. um, um, uh, Houston won Best Director, too. Oh, did he? Okay. Yes. All right. And Laurence Olivier won Best best Actor and Best Picture. Mm-hmm. I would have gone the opposite way. I would have given Best Actor to Humphrey Bogart and Best Picture to Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and I would give Best Director to um, Laurence Olivier, because he made Hamlet come alive. He mm-hmm. did. We've talked about this. He's my least favorite Hamlet. I just <laughs> said it again. Good Lord. No disrespect to Oh, Lawrence. so you're saying Laurence Olivier is not good, is what you're saying. Come on now. Your <laughs> words, not mine, ladies and gentlemen. That's Josh's words. He's technologically advanced, but those are his words. Anyway, um, so... Humphrey Bogart in African Queen, if you've never seen it, it's alcoholic again. Mm -hmm. Um, Catherine Hepburn's in it. And it's one of those performances where when you watch it, it doesn't matter what the discussion was about him winning. You're happy he won an Oscar and that it was for this. If this was the one he was going to win it for, then so be it. Mm -hmm. And it's... he holds it down. He and Catherine Hepburn is a pain in the butt in this movie. She is really difficult. She's a really difficult character to handle. And you're kind of wondering when, you know, he's going to throw her overboard. The African queen is a boat mm-hmm. and she commissions him to take her somewhere on uh, in this boat and so forth. The story goes from there. But anyway, Humphrey Bogart, 1951, the African queen, yet another one, put it on your list because I think it's worth yeah, watching. I, I need to, <clears throat> I've only seen this movie once, but it it reinforced my faith in William Holden, and it was Stalag Seventeen. Yeah, and I don't know if I would even necessarily want to like revisit it, but uh, but yeah, I, I really do like William Holden. I mean, from a from how. I guess there's there were other movies kind of like I mean you have like Great Escape and Stalag Seventeen and then you've got these other movies that are kind of based on similar situations. We're in the decade after World War Two, so makes I mean, sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does make sense. But um, that, did did you have well, anything to say about him specifically or that? Oh, no, <laughs> let movie? me think. Do I have something to say about an actor in the Oscars? Um, uh, the chances are it's yes for that always. Mm-hmm. What what I find interesting about that performance is is he is the unlikable character. He is not very likable in this film. As the character, the people don't like him. Uh, his uh, comrades, if you will, mm-hmm. what he does, and it's all for a self well a non a selfless sacrificing thing mm-hmm. in other words he sacrifices himself for others but at the time to- at the time that the movie's ev- evolving you don't you think he's just this piece of <laughs> i can't think of a word that uh is trying to articulate what i'm saying he just you think he's not a good guy yeah and he pulls that off because he's likable as a 
as a character actor, he's likable as a as a movie star. Mm-hmm. There's just something so calculated about his performance that, and it's also like, is it the lead? Is it not the lead? It's one of those ones that fall in between, but without his character, you couldn't have the movie work. Mm -hmm. And because what his character does and he pulls it off so well, you're like, oh, he fooled them, me, and everybody around him and ended up doing the right thing at the end. So for that reason, yeah, I think it's a great win. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and then right after that, the next year, uh, and I saw this movie because of you on the waterfront. Changed the landscape of acting, and no we, doubt about it. And we had the whole episode, we talked the whole episode about it, so there's not really much to say, but I mean, it's, and, and I haven't seen any of the other movies, so it's hard for me to, you know, compare, I guess, but it, it is a performance that needed to be recognized, and it got recognized. Well, what I said originally was, it's the performance that you've heard about. It's in the lexicon of the language of film. People imitate it. They joke around about it. They satire it. They do all of these references to it. And then when you see it, you go, oh, my goodness. You know, the whole, I could have been a contender. Yeah, you, but it's not even those scenes that are the scene, that are as memorable to me as... I mean, yes, the scene in the, but, but I mean, that glove scene yeah. is just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I knew that that could have been a contender scene was coming up. I did not know that glove scene was coming up. Interesting. And that it did. It blew my, I felt like I was experiencing it like somebody in the theater in 1954 would have experienced it. Oh, nice. Whereas in the same movie, I'm seeing a scene that's so famous that, I've seen it just in passing multiple times. Not the whole scene, but just that that cut. You know, yeah, but I think my point was that yeah. it still is so, it holds up so well, even though you've seen it, heard it, imitated yep. it. It's still, when it's in the content, I know what he's the, talking about yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and it's, you're like, what? Wait, mm-hmm. this is what this is about? Devastatingly believable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's you can go on and on and on. But he did. He changed the landscape of the acting world. There's no doubt about it. He he made things that were over the top, uh, illogical, believable, and grounded. From that point on, the whole world changed when it came to believing a person as an actor playing a part in a movie, so forth mm-hmm. and so on. Definitely. Yeah, mine jumps from 1954 on to 1970 before. I mean, I've seen a lot of these movies. I saw. Have you seen Judgment at Nuremberg? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. We've talked about this. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. we talked about Judy Garland and Montgomery Cliff Mm -hmm. basically ad libbing their scenes. Um, And yeah, Maximilian Schell. Schell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah, I saw it once. And I think I need to see it again because it was difficult to get through not as far as like being engaging it was just kind of like this is real this really happened and i mean i don't know just makes you kind of depressed yeah it's not one of those movies that you want to watch on saturday night just to feel good about your life that is for sure i mean it's in it's engaging it's um powerful and it's interesting because i think maximilian shell is the least interesting of all of them but that's what i think is great about him being recognized is that he's so solid and so believable that those straight and narrow characters we've talked about that atticus finch Mm -hmm. from to kill a mockingbird there's no over the top oscar moment there's no you know he has maximilian shell has more of those moments Mm -hmm. but it's nice to see the everyday guy, the lawyer, the guy who's trying to do the right thing, the guy who's not supposed to be showy. He has a job to do. It's nice to see that guy get recognized. It's like I call it the Michael Clayton syndrome. George Clooney, there's no over-the-top moment, but he was recognized for um, an Oscar nomination. And I think those are important roles to be recognized because all these showy parts, um, uh, people with disabilities and all, all of these... They've got a hook. Yeah, they've got a hook. That's the way to put it. And and yeah, you've got these other characters who don't have a hook, but still rise above. Yeah, and he's one of them, Maximilian Shell. Yeah. What year was that? Uh, that was, uh-oh, lost it. It was 61. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I've seen most of these movies. I saw Ernest Borgnine and Marty. 
I saw Yul Brenner. I seen Ali Guinness, a Bridge on the River Kwai. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, David Niven, Separate Tables. I've seen all these: Charlton Heston, Burt Lancaster, Elmer Gentry. Have you seen that? Mm-mm. That's a weird movie, dude. Really? Yeah, it's a. It's kind of like um, Night of the Hunter, oh. where he's this. You're not sure if he's a good guy or a bad guy, and he goes and discovers being a preacher or. Um, uh, you know, like tent revival type situations. And he's had a uh, checkered past, one with Shirley Jones, Mrs. Partridge, yeah. who is a prostitute in wow. this. She's great in this. She won the Oscar too. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. And you're thinking, wait, Mrs. Partridge was a prostitute in a movie and won an Oscar? She deserves it. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a really interesting movie because... The way that Burt Lancaster plays it, you're not sure if he is a good guy or if he's a bad guy, if he's manipulating the God thing for his profit, mm-hmm. or he, uh, the lead woman is Gene Simmons, and she's a firm belief. Kiss, right? No, stop it. <laughs> J E A N, actress. Yes. Yes. Every time I heard her name when I was a kid, I was like, oh, from Kiss? Yeah, I love Kiss. <laughs> no, completely different person, but yes, yeah. I get the reference. But anyway, she's completely a believer, mm-hmm. and you're never sure whether or not Burt Lancaster is doing this for the right reason. So for that reason, I'm glad he won the Oscar for that performance. Yeah, I think you should see that too, um, because it's, it's off-putting it, in, in a good way. I've seen all these. Uh, oh, that's great. Man for All Seasons, Rod Steiger. Have you seen In the Heat of the Night? Mm-mm. Yeah, no. interesting film. Interesting film. Um, I saw My Fair Lady. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, Rex yeah. Harris. No, it's fun. Yeah, but the next one on my list goes to 1970. Do you have anything before that? Mm-mm. Yeah, George C. Scott yeah. Patton. Yeah, he, you know it's an often talked about one because he refused to go to the award ceremony. He didn't believe in the competition between actors. I get it, mm-hmm. but there was nobody else that year who should have won the Oscar. That's a strange movie too. I saw that the first time I saw it and I I don't think I really took it all in, but Patton, did Patton really believe he was from past lives? You remember when he's standing on the side of that battleground? He goes, back in 19 whatever, I was standing here at... Did he really believe he was... I don't know, but I think that he understood, or at least his character as it was written in the movie, understood how important it is to, other, to, to soldiers to have a leader. And, and there, was a, there was the concept of Patton, and there was, you know, I guess also the, the real-life person of Patton, but, but the concept of Patton is the nickel-plated revolvers and the, you know, the, the, the big speech and the American flag and the, you know, bombastic, you know, interface with with his his troops and that's what he that's what he chose to do that's how he chose to to lead lead his men and and it was effective i mean I yeah guess. but do you but, know anything about the history of that guy did he no, really because i never i haven't read any books about the him. the second time i saw this movie i was like wait what he says weird stuff <laughs> How, how many times have you seen this film? I've only seen it once. Okay, when you ever get a chance to watch it again, listen very carefully. He believes he's reincarnated generals and colonels from all these other wars. Okay. He says that a couple of times, and you're like, "Wait, what?" So I'm, I, I see everything you just said. But like, for, for, from my standpoint, it's like if I'm gonna, if somebody's gonna lead me into battle, if I'm gonna follow somebody into battle, I want to follow somebody into battle who thinks that he was whatever who thinks that that he's been in multiple other battles you know what i mean like if he's confident just as long as he's not saying like hey why don't you like jump off that well yeah there's a difference between being confident and saying yes we're we're going we're going to accomplish this thing that we set out to do and watch the other guys when he says that (laughs) watch their look they're like wait what did he oh. just say? Yeah. I think they feel a little bit more uncertain about following him into battle oh, after maybe. he said then yeah. it's not effective. It's an interesting, interesting performance. I'm glad he won. I, I get what he's saying about the competition thing because, you know, is there really a way that you can say somebody was the best in this subjective But like you said, like you've said in the past, what the what 
the Academy Awards have done for you and, and to a certain extent for me, I, I think too, but especially for you is it's gotten you, it's gotten you into movies that you may not have been interested in. I mean, or like never last, even heard of. Yeah. Like last week with, with uh, Nightcrawler, you, you were going to wait on that movie. It started getting some heat from SAG awards and you decided you wanted to experience that in the theater and you're, happy that you did absolutely and that's what the academy awards or awards can do as opposed to pitting one actor against the other and all that yeah you see know? i'm on that side of it too yeah yeah all right so who's next for you um i mean i've got i've got brando from from the godfather down I, I saw the french connection and i know that he's kind of that uh you know popeye doyle is kind of like a flawed you know hero i guess but i mean I saw it once, and I'd much rather watch um, the the conversation than than this movie, uh, or than than French Connection. And I'd much rather watch, Gene, you know, whatever Hoosiers or whatever, you know, that other more interesting versions of of or other more interesting performances of Gene Hackman. So, how, how do you feel about that film, The French Connection? I I guess it it doesn't. It's not as memorable to me other than the the ending just the ending well people who love this movie love it they're like it's the best film ever i don't get it yeah i don't i don't i think the ending is interesting yeah i think the movie's interesting interesting, i think the whole everything about it's interesting but for me it it doesn't ring as a best picture winner it doesn't ring as a best pick or best actor winner although it did win Mm-hmm. But maybe it's one of those films that after like the third or fourth time you watch it, it clicks because it hasn't clicked for me yet. So maybe mm-hmm. it's going to, you're right, I'd rather watch Gene Hackman in Unforgiven or uh, anything, actually. He was in the Poseidon Adventure, which was on uh, TCM last night. Oh, yeah. And I'm way more interested in that. Than That's I, a fun movie, though. I love yeah, that Ernest movie. Yeah, Ernest Borgnine in that yeah, one. And- there was uh, um, Red Buttons, uh, Ernest Borgnine, um Gene Hackman, who else? All Academy Award winners. Yeah. There was somebody else. Oh, um, Shelley Winters. Oh, yeah. Academy Award winner uh, t- twice. Yeah, there's, it's just this huge cast. And I was thinking when I was watching it last night, side note, side story, my parents took me to a lot of those disaster movies when I was a kid. Towering, Towering Inferno. Inferno. Yeah. Jaws, Earthquake. Earthquake. I'm thinking... Who takes their 11-year-old kid to these movies? Get the hell well, out of here. they me. wanted to see it, so they just take you along. Well, not only that, but it actually is smart because it taught you to be aware of your surroundings, oh, yeah. you know, and you're like, what would you do if? You know, that wasn't, I don't think, their intention, mm-hmm. but it sure came across that way. But they took me to see uh, Poseidon Adventure, huh. and I, I'm fascinated. I look at things differently now, like if they were upside down because of that movie. Uh-huh. Yeah, and they remade it. It's it's okay. I but saw it. Yeah, yeah watch but... the original. The original. Oh, I've seen the original. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying that to anybody else. Oh, who has, you're saying. Yeah, watch the original. Before. Don't pay attention to yeah, this. It's got one. its cheese ball moments, but I actually think it held up fairly well. I watched quite a bit of it last night. Anyway, Gene yeah. Hackman. So yeah, you're right. I agree with you. I think French Connection is one of those films that it's up there on all these people's Top ten and list. That's why I watched it. Yeah, yeah, me too. So maybe it just hasn't clicked for me yet. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm not going to say I didn't like the film. I'm saying I just didn't get it yet. Mm-hmm. Same with his performance. Yeah, 19, 1975, Jack Nicholson for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. We've talked about it. Yeah, you can't touch it. Yeah, yeah, you just can't touch it. He's just. So let's move on to something a little bit more interesting then, since we've already talked about that. Uh, Peter Finch and Network. So we talked about Network. I enjoy Network. I like William Holden. I like Faye Dunaway. Why did Peter Finch win this? Win this? Because he convinced you that he would, that you would put your head out of a window and scream what he's screaming on TV. And when you're watching it, you know you're watching the descent of a person into madness. From complete awareness as a human being to something that sets him off that clicks whatever that mental disorder that happens to him, his health switches and you see it. But yet 
he still convinces you that he would make the world stick their head out the window and say, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. And of course, you see that in the film. And you're convinced that as an audience member, you know that he is over the edge. He has gone insane. He has lost his mind. But in the world, he has convinced them, because that's what they want to see, mm-hmm. that he makes completely set he makes complete sense because he is now speaking the truth. So it's an over the top performance. But for me, I'm fine with him winning best actor because of those reasons. He could have played insanity. He could have played all of which are not objective. So you can't play them, Mm -hmm. but it could have been. Do you think it's like a grounded insanity? Yeah. uh, Well, it's a believable, believable. It's a believable insane. I believed if I was there at the time, Watching his news program, I would not know he was an insane person. I would think that he was just a person who was making a lot of sense about giving up on the way being conformist to the society that we're in now. And Mm -hmm. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I wouldn't know that he was insane. I'm an audience member watching that, so I know that. But in that world, you know, I think only William Holden really gets it. Like he's not right people he's not right he's not mm-hmm. well well you know, Faye Dunaway is looking at it in a totally different yeah, way yeah. yeah she's Renee Russo Russo yeah. in Nightcrawler we talked exactly. about that but um you know uh, I just thought of an analogy and it just slipped my mind I was going to compare his performance to oh I know who uh, Michael Clayton reference again mm-hmm. Tom Wilkinson and Michael Clayton mm-hmm. he makes a lot of sense but he's lost his mind yeah. and he's unbalanced and he's off his meds yeah back in network time they didn't have meds for this kind of stuff yeah, that's true. i would have never even thought if i lived in that world that he might need meds i just would have thought this is a guy who had an awakening and he is he's making got it figured out he's yeah he's got it <laughs> figured out and he's saying he's speaking the truth why do you have problems with him winning no i mean he just wasn't to, to me he wasn't he was the person that people were bouncing off of like he wasn't I was more interested in how Faye Dunaway dealt with the situation and in how William Holden dealt with the situation and in how these other characters dealt with what was going on around them as opposed to specifically Peter Finch. And also he died in between yeah. Yeah. that. And so, it, I mean, it, it's obviously happened since then too. And I'm not saying that Heath Only Ledger, once though. I know, I'm not saying that Heath Ledger, who we're going to talk about later on, uh, didn't deserve his Academy Award, but... You, you start, I mean, part of me comes at things like this from some sort of cynicism, and I want to make sure that, I want to make sure that he's, that there's a, a good reason other than that he happened to have passed away between the time that the movie came out and the Academy Awards. Because if you look at, I mean, if you look at that year, you've got Sylvester Stallone for Rocky, you've got William Holden for Network. And you've got Robert De Niro for Taxi Driver, um, along with Giancarlo Giannini. Oh, my gosh. He was in a Bond movie. Two and, Bond movies. And what movie was he in that, that year? That he's not- Seven Beauties? Yeah, I've never seen that. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's good in the Bond movies. But um, anyway, so I, I guess in seeing most of those movies and in seeing you know where, you know, where I would have put stuff, I, I just wanted to... Get get your opinion on that, I guess. Well, we've talked about this before where performances do get recognized because the person was sick or they almost died or they did die, if you will. But when the performance is as solid as his is, I don't care anymore. That's all white noise. Okay. The performance holds up to an Oscar-worthy performance. So I'm okay with it. Do I think De Niro ultimately is more interesting Then Peter Fitch, maybe. Mm -hmm. Would I have voted for Peter Finch? I don't know. But when I saw Network, I was like, oh, I see why he won. I'm fine with the reason why he won. All the other stuff is white noise for me. Okay. What's your next one? Richard Dreyfuss from The Goodbye Girl. Have you seen this film? No, I haven't seen it. Okay. Here's one of these performances where you look at it and you go, oh, he's kind of the buffoon of the movie. He's the, 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 the... comedic actor he's playing an actor in the in the film and 
you know, the basic uh, plot line is he moves into Marsha Mason's apartment because she has a breakup. Marsha Mason has a younger daughter or daughter. She, I guess she's probably eight, nine, ten, or something like that, somewhere around there. Um, real uh, sharp witted uh, young girl. And Richard Dreyfus is an actor trying to make it in New York, and he moves in because she has a room for rent and pretty much overtakes the world. You know, he chants naked with incense burning in the living room. And they're all like, yeah. what are you doing, dude? Yeah. But it's it's a Neil Simon movie, mm-hmm. and it's a comedy. And you think, well, why did Richard Dreyfus win this Oscar? Especially since this is the last year, I believe, that Richard Burton was nominated for Equus. Mm-hmm. And everybody thought he was going to finally win his Oscar, which he never did win an Oscar. And Richard Dreyfus ends up winning the Oscar. So this is one of those ones that people debate that, well, Equus was this great play that was turned into this great movie with this great part for Richard uh, Burton. Why didn't Richard Burton win? And then there's this scene in The Goodbye Girl, which reminds everybody why Richard Dreyfus won the Oscar. He has, he's uh, getting ready to perform Richard III and the director wants him to perform it in this very flamboyant, stereotypically um, homosexual way. It's very over the top. And he doesn't want to do it, but you know he's a working actor. He's got to do what the director wants him to do. And he knows it's going to be this huge bomb. And it turns out to be exactly what he thinks it's going to be. And you think it's going to be this light comical moment. And they go, the daughter and Marsha Mason, Marsha Mason? Is that her name? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, she was nominated that year too. But they go see the play and they were like, that was terrible. And the little girl's like, but we got to go backstage and see him. And she's like, but I don't want to. It's terrible. What? Are... And she's like, he's going to know we thought it was terrible if we don't go backstage. <laughs> and they go backstage and every second of that scene is why Richard Dreyfus won the Oscar. It's devastatingly memorable. Mm-hmm. So for that reason, you know what? I think you and Steph would like that film. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a lighthearted comedy on some kind of level, mm-hmm. but then it smacks you. And it's got that feel good moment that Neil Simon films have, but it's one of those ones that everybody always goes, Oh, it's, you know, it was the feel good movie of the year. Richard Dreyfus won it, but they have to really watch it in order to understand it. Anyway, moving on. Great. Uh, 1980, Robert De Niro, Raging Bull. Yeah, it's just it's. We talked about it. What what, what <laughs> else is there to say? On. Yeah, I mean, just talk about commitment and dedication yeah. and focus. And I don't understand how. And people- it's a real person too. That's the other thing is that you know there is a real person who was alive at the time, and and he's having to incorporate all that and be true to it and bring himself to that role too, and and go through what he went through as far as weight gain and. And do you know, have you seen a lot about the real life guy? Like not can, too much. I mean, I've got the special edition DVD and I watched some, spe- some extras on it, but is it like when you see Christian Bale in the fighter and then you see the real guy at the end and you go, Oh my gosh, Christian Bale <laughs> nailed that. Like, well, is yeah. Jake LaMotta like that. Um, see, I don't know anything about him. I, I don't know too much about it and it's been a while since i even watched the the special I, i've watched the movie fairly recently but i haven't seen the special you know edition uh you know extras for for a while but um see i'm gonna go look up jake lamata tomorrow yeah. take a look at how he acts and what he does i'm sure it's well i mean he, he i think all of those things are true he did have a kind of like a you know vegas type you know, variety show type thing, you know? So, I mean, he was that kind of a type performer. Yeah, but I'm talking about the mannerisms and all that other stuff. How how well did... Yeah, I'm did not he, sure. Because sometimes you have to separate the two, and one is, uh, you know, a fictional account of mm-hmm. a movie sure. star. It's like Sissy Spacek and Coal Miner's Daughter. Uh-huh. She looked and sung and acted like Loretta Lynn. I mean, mm-hmm. she became her. And uh, she won that same year, actually, mm-hmm. um, that... Oh, cool. Robert De Niro one. So I'm curious to see what he's really like versus, you know, how De Niro ended up interpreting what, you know, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When Michelle Williams played Marilyn Monroe, Mm -hmm. they said, was it hard to try to figure out how to imitate her? And she said, this is my version of Marilyn Monroe. This is how I'm interpreting the character 
known as Marilyn Monroe. So she didn't have to do an imitation. She didn't have to do a caricature. She didn't have to do the voice exactly the same. It was her interpretation of what she thought Marilyn Monroe would be like as a real person. Which actually frees you from Absolute. those bounds. Yeah. yeah, and I thought she did do it. She got an Oscar nomination. There, there you go. go. All right. And what's your next one? Um, well, I, I jump because I just made the list, but there's a few on here. Ben Kingsley, you haven't seen Gandhi. Mm-hmm. And you, you've you seen Amadeus or you've not seen Amadeus? Nope. Okay, yeah, that's a must-see um, because F. Murray Abraham... And then, um, you know, there's it jumps from Paul Newman to Michael Douglas, Dustin Hoffman to Daniel Day Lewis in My Left Foot. And that's just one of those performances that everybody says, oh, a person with a handicap, a person with a disability, a person with some kind of physical malady or. Yeah, yeah will win the deficiency. Oscar because yeah. that's Oscar bait. Then you see My Left Foot and you go, this is why. This is why. This, this person performing. This character is why it's Oscar bait because mm-hmm. it's so difficult to do what he did. Yeah. We talked about him too. When I told you about the as if, you know, I was learning these techniques in college and they were talking about as ifs. And I thought it was, it's as if you were at your favorite um, uncle's funeral. So you were devastated because your favorite uncle had passed. It's not. And as if, is and Daniel Day Lewis clarified this for me. He played my left foot as if he was a 747 that couldn't get off the ground. As if he was this huge jumbo jet plane that could not get off the ground. And you can actually see how he's physicalized what his imagination would be like, what a big huge plane would be like trying to get off the ground trying to grumble and do all that Mm -hmm. and when you watch his performance you can see he's fighting it the whole entire time it was brilliant it clarified so many things for me i was like that makes perfect sense so you can't say you can't say enough about daniel day lewis let alone this one right here and this year was the year that tom cruise was supposed to win for born on the fourth of july Mm -hmm. or morgan freeman was supposed to win for driving miss daisy and a buddy robin williams from dead poets there you go and a buddy of mine said Watch out for this Daniel Day Lewis guy. I'm telling you, that's the performance that's going to get recognized, and he ended up being right. So, it's it's a must see if people haven't seen it because it's a great film too. But it's a incredible performance. Mm-hmm. I, I I can't even think of the right adjectives to describe how mm-hmm. on point he is in this movie. There's also a parallel this year with uh, a similar uh, situation with the movie Theory of Everything, where Eddie Redmayne's playing Stephen Hawking. And that one, you see someone who's a completely fully functioning person kind of get worse and worse and right. worse due to this due to this uh, issue that the, the physical issue that he has. I can't remember what it is, what it's called. But anyway, and so you'll get to see kind of a transform. That's more of like a transformation movie, I right. think, um, you know, but but yeah, you're right. I mean, and it, I'm sure there will be. I don't want to say I'm sure there will be, but there could be comparisons with Daniel Day Lewis. Well, they're going to people are going to be cynical and they're going to say those things about this the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, of well, course he's going to yeah, get nominated because he had a physical uh, deformity and this this happened to him and that's Oscar bait and blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. The guy pulls it off and makes it believable, and you see Stephen Hawking. Hawking, Hawking, Hawking. I can't ever say his name. If you see him come to life in front of your eyes, then give the guy the Oscar nomination. And it looks like he's set up for one, but mm-hmm. there's always one that gets left off the list that you think is going to be on the list, and one that gets onto the list that you have no idea that you see coming. It happens every single year, and I think this is the guy who's probably going to get left off. So okay. yeah, that's well, just I, I don't right. know. I don't know. You're calling it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm saying I don't know, but you know. So we talked about Nicolas Cage leaving Las Vegas. Did you see Shine with... Uh, I did. What did you think of that? I saw it a long time ago. I mean, I saw pretty much when it came out. Um, and I thought the piano playing in it was, you know, that R- Rachmaninoff that they play in that movie was was great. I, I really enjoyed the the music itself. Um, you're, you're back to the deficiency thing. I mean, you're, you've got a character who's playing got an actor who's playing a character with a deficiency and and how they play that i mean uh, have you seen the real life guy 
I think I did. Yeah. When they did like a 60 Minutes yeah. on him or something. Yeah, yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, he, yeah. he uh, Jeffrey Rush is, you know, dead on. But the thing about this performance for me is I have no problem with Jeffrey Rush winning it. That's perfectly fine. But it's the kid in the beginning of the film that I was more impressed with yeah. than Jeffrey Rush. And actually, mm. Jeffrey Rush is in less of the film than that kid is. So I, I find it interesting that... How much of Jeffrey Rush's performance really won the Oscar, and how much did he win because that the kid? Yeah, the kid kind of yeah, the kid kind of helped him out, you know. Yeah, uh, well, and that's funny you say that because uh, a few years before that, Anthony Hopkins in 1991 won for Silence of the Lambs, and he's only in 20 minutes of the movie. It's different though. That's different though because for me it's different because without that character, that film would not work, and he is so. Impactic is that a word that he has such an impact on the the on story characters yeah, in the movie <laughs> on the story that you cannot stop thinking about Hannibal Lecter. So he became the best actor, the lead actor in the movie, even though he's only got twenty eight minutes on film. Mm-hmm. He that twenty eight minutes is an hour and a half's worth of performance. There's no doubt about it. When he's on screen, it's you know, two minutes long, but it's really 20 minutes long. He, he really fills it up. So I think that's a little bit different, but I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I didn't write this down, but Denzel Washington and Training Day. I've only seen that movie once. I, I need to see it again, but it was disturbing. Very disturbing. And And maybe that's why I haven't seen it since then. Yeah, I can't sit through it again. I'll be honest with you. I saw it once. And here's, you just said, I called it, right? Well, here's what I said. I think we've talked about this before. I came out of that movie and I said, it's the best performance of his career. It's too bad he'll never win the Oscar. That's what I said. (laughs) Because I thought it was too hardcore of a film and a performance for people to want to give an Oscar for it because he is... the bad guy. Yeah, he's the only non-sympathetic character in Oscar history to win the Oscar. That's true. Hannibal, you want to have lunch with him. You're hoping he doesn't want to have you for lunch. <laughs> right. You know, Misery, you feel bad for her. She has a vulnerability. Mm-hmm. You know, Joe Pesci and Goodfellas. I mean, there's all these Oscar winners that are bad characters and bad people, but they have a vulnerability or humanness to them. Not that guy in um, Training Day. Mm-hmm. He is... He's you, bad to the core. When what yeah. happens to him at the end of that film happens, you're like... Yes, Mm -hmm. do it again. Show it again, you know? And it's edited to where it looks like it happens more often than it does. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yes, I'm glad. And you're rooting for somebody to, you know, violently have the end of their life happen in front of your eyes. But (sighs) But he got you to that point. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Even when he sees what might be his son in the movie, because that's a little bit uh, not defined, Mm -hmm. Uh, Eva Mendez's kid. I don't even remember that part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even then, Denzel Washington's like, hey, what's up, kid? You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's King Kong. What does he say? I'm King Kong. Uh, yeah, he said it does say Crazy that. great. <laughs> I was happy he won that Oscar. Philip Seymour Hoffman for Capote. We've, we've talked about him. We talked about him last week, but, um, but yeah, I mean, he's you're right. A- it's a transformation. And, and it's, once again, we're at the situation that we were with Raging Bull where you've got a, a You've got a real person who who has you know been seen by people. I mean, who's who's known and famously uh, um, the mannerisms, the voice, yeah, all everything, of that is known, everything, very famous. And here's why I think his performance is so brilliant. Yes, it's it's not an imitation; it's a real live, a realized, full character. But Phil Seymour Hoffman doesn't look like him had the body type like him or anything. He lost a significant amount of weight to play him because Truman mm-hmm. Capote was really thin and small. Small. Yeah. Very small. But everything, he did everything he could do to be real without imitating him. Yeah. You know, The voice is similar but not exactly the same. Mm-hmm. But in order to make that character believable throughout a whole entire film, you might have had to downplay maybe something that was grating in real life or upplay something that was not as interesting in, or boring in his tones and cadence. So whatever he did, he did it because you no longer saw Philip Seymour Hoffman. You saw Capote. Not my favorite performance of that year, but mm-hmm. I was 
perfectly okay with him winning. Now, you skipped a couple of people that I, um, I wanted to make mention of. Um, Adrian Brody for The Pianist. I haven't seen that one. Yeah. Well, the cool thing about this one is, is that all four of the other nominees that year have won an Oscar before. Oh, wow. Okay. Hmm. So, and all, um, Nicolas Cage was great in adaptation. Everybody thought that uh, Daniel Day-Lewis was going to win for Gangs of New York, and I love Jack Nicholson in About Schmidt. I think it's one of Jack Nicholson's, for me, it's his best performance. Mm -hmm. It's the least like Jack Nicholson of all his performances. Have you seen About Schmidt? No. Yeah, you'll love it. It's a great (laughs) performance. It's off-kiltered. It's not, there's something weird about the world. It's not your... It's not your typical world, mm-hmm. um, and it's something that you should. It's like a Coen Brothers film without being a Coen Brothers film. Oh, okay, um, I can't think of the director right off bat. Um, um, Nebraska. Oh, uh, Nicholas Payne. No, oh. no, Alexander Payne. <laughs> no, no, um, Alexander Payne. That's right. No, what are you going to say, Nicholas Sparks? What were you going to say, Nicholas? Nicholas Payne? Where'd that come from? That's all right. Anyway, yeah. but uh, I couldn't even think of his name at all, so you did better than I did. Yes, he has a, an interesting voice, and the reason why I say Coen Brothers is because if you're looking for your normal, everyday story, you're not going to find it mm-hmm. in uh, Nicholas Payne. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Alexander Payne. Yeah, that's all right. Um, you know, you can't have that's everything. His middle name. Yes. That's what I'm going with. Yeah, we're going with Nick. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but Adrian Brody won, and it was... It's probably the biggest surprise since I've been watching the Oscars. I came out of The Pianist that day, watching. I watched the movie that day, called my buddy in New York. We made our predictions. He said, Daniel Day-Lewis is going to win. I said, I'm not so sure. This Adrian Brody guy I just saw. And he's like, not a chance in hell. And I, and I said, I don't know. And Nick um, Adrian Brody ended up winning. And if you've never seen this film, it's a hard movie to watch. Mm-hmm. It's... He invests 150% into this character, and he has to pretend to play the piano when there's no piano. Mm. Like, he physically is moving his fingers on a table Mm -hmm. because he can't play the piano because of his life situation, Mm -hmm. but he looks like he's playing, and it's believable. So... I don't know if Adrian Brody can play the piano. It's like um, Miles Teller in... Um, and Whiplash. Wish, whiplash. He had to really know how to play, but yeah. how much, how well did he play? He convinced you he could play really well. He did, but if you would have heard him playing, probably wouldn't have sounded like right. Good. Same thing with Adrian Brody. I have no idea, but he convinces you he can play. Plus, all the other things that he has to go through. So it's a, it's a it's a must see, but it's also something that needs to be mentioned because that year was interesting. That mm-hmm. of all the four who could have possibly won the one person that nobody expected to win ended up winning. So I was happy for him. That's great. And then uh, Sean Penn for Mystic River, but we can go on from there. Mm -hmm. So you talked about Philip Seymour Hoffman for Capote. I saw Last King of Scotland, but I mean, I I wasn't... There was something that, that just didn't engage me about that movie, and maybe it's just the being depressed about how that guy is actually a real person. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's not an easy movie to watch. It's also one of those movies where we had talked about, will you watch it again with Nightcrawler? I'm not so sure I want to see The Last King yeah. of Scotland because I I saw a clip of Force Whitaker from this film and I thought, oh, he's going to be nominated. He's probably going to win. Mm-hmm. And he was engaging as that character and he even has a vulnerability that unlike Training Day, Denzel Washington, unlike that character, you mm-hmm. still you see a little bit They're of like, his, oh, then maybe this is why he got here. Yeah, exactly. But but jeez, Louise. Yeah. yeah, I'm 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 not interested in living in that world ever again. But that's a compliment. Mm-hmm. And you know, 2007 was a great year in movies, and Daniel Day Lewis playing Daniel Plainview and There Will Be Blood and it was. I mean, that was kind of like the confluence of... I didn't even know too much about him. I'd seen him in in Gangs of New York. This is the movie that made me go back and see My Left Foot. I mean, Really? Oh, yeah. I wanted to see everything that... And there's certain... I still haven't seen... All, I haven't seen In the Name of the Father. I haven't seen that one. I have. Um, and, and so I need to... I need to just... 
spend the time to 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 seek those out but and maybe part of it's kind of like i don't want to like ruin my i saw nine right after there will be blood wasn't the greatest movie um and i don't know if it necessarily has anything to do with daniel day lewis it was a musical and based on eight and a half i saw it yeah so um yeah i think he's a it didn't seem like he fit Mm. in that situation but he fits perfectly in there will be blood and that's what we're talking about right now not nine and so (laughs) i'm so glad you did that because i didn't want to say anything bad about him so that he transforms obviously in in and i think in this movie he complete he used every he used every chance he had every opportunity he had to make to make the character unique and to show you exactly what what's happening you can you can see through that the motivations of that character and it's very easily uh, i'm not saying it's i'm not saying it's a simple character i'm saying it's easily understandable where he's coming from with all all of throughout the whole movie i mean even how he interacts with his brother in quotes and how he interacts with his son and how he treats other people and humanity in general. I mean, you know. You know what? He's the great, great grandfather of Jake Gyllenhaal and Nightcrawler. Yeah. You know, it's this one, this laser beam focus that these characters have not as actors, but the characters, Mm -hmm. that they cannot see anything except for, I mean, that one scene where they're describing all of the land that he has, Mm -hmm. and all he can focus on is why doesn't... That little, the bandy tract. Yeah, why don't I have these? Yeah, he has no other focus other than why don't I have this part right here? It's not complete. Yeah, I want this. I need this. But he's, it's, it's the whole trying to fill a hole in his heart or in you know oh yeah it's that whole thing and it, that's not a new that's not a, a new uh you know thing but it but the the way that he goes about it and and how severe and savage he is well paul thomas anderson does a makes a decision decision not to ask for forgiveness at the end of the film as the filmmaker or as the character, usually the character who is so driven that they're not seeing things clearly and they're hurting other people in their life because they're trying to fill a hole in their life are uh, feeling are asking for um, sympathy at the end of the film and asking for forgiveness. Whatever, yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry I acted this way. I was trying to fill my hole you know, with uh, worldly goods. Yeah. This character's like... Daniel Plainview doubled down. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) That's a great way to put it. That's perfect. And and Daniel Day-Lewis, I was thinking about this while you were talking, that he's just a step away from being off. Like if he made a choice to the left a little too much or a choice to the right a little too mm-hmm. much, that he might be considered a bad actor because he makes bold choices. Well, the milkshake scene yeah. is is a bold choice. Absolutely. Almost everything about his performance in There Will Be Blood, all of his performances, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's, there's a boldness to it that could go wrong. In- but he, he's comedic at certain scenes, like... Uh, I mean, when he's in the church, when he's like, give me the blood, Eli. I mean, that's hilarious. I feel uneasy laughing at that, though. But, but you have to look at it from his from his standpoint. Like, you know, I mean, I'm a churchgoer, and I don't have any any problems watching someone who who looks at the artifice of religion and sees through that in, in his you know, in, in his viewpoint. So he's seeing right through any, the, and, and they have the scene afterwards, you know, in, when they talk outside of the, the church too, where they com- he compares the two, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. so, so it, it, it totally makes sense. But then once he, you know, he, he has to go through the theatrics and he really plays up the theatrics to comedic effect. And, and, and you can tell that Eli, you know, is a little, offended and he's like hey don't make fun of me 
You know, that's what yeah, he's doing. Yeah, you said you were going to take this he's seriously. Making, he's yeah. making fun of him. Yeah. You know? I'm going to do what you told me to do so I can get what I want from you, but be careful what you wish for. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Okay. And then... Uh, what do we got next? Well, Milk, I guess. Yeah. That's the next, that's the next year. Yeah. That's back to back. And I've talked about how 2008 is the best acting year I've ever seen. Wow. All five of them mm-hmm. could have won all five of them. I would have been fine with whoever won. I mean, it's Mickey Rourke from the wrestler. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's brilliant in that. Yeah. It's, it's not only brought him back to life, but it is a grand performance. And that's the great part about that performance is that it's it has a parallel in life in in his life, I think, you know. You you've got uh, an actor who's hasn't done too much work cuz this was bef- did he No, he did Sin City, didn't he? Before yeah, he this. had done Sin City, but and that was the biggest, that's the highest profile thing he had done. And people were that. talking about possible Oscar nomination for that, but he still hadn't come out of the strange world yeah. known as Mickey Rourke up to that point. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, there there was a, a parallel though. Absolutely, yeah. but it it was the way that he plays it is so much more interesting than. It, it didn't even need that real life story because he's so committed to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, his hair, his body, he looks like that guy. He, the way he holds his body, everything mm-hmm. about him. It's a very Mickey Rourke performance, mm-hmm. but I'm glad he got the Oscar um, Nomin- nomination, nomination yeah. and everybody thought he was going to win. I was like, I'm not so sure about that. When you're seeing Sean Penn and Milk, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, so that and what were you going to say? I was just saying, Evan Rachel Wood. It doesn't get enough credit for anything she does. I don't think. I, I don't mean, know about that. She just got an Emmy and Golden Globe nomination a couple of years ago for, for True Blood, or no, for, for um, the Kate Winslet miniseries that she did. Oh, um, Mildred Pierce. Yeah, she okay. sure did. Yeah, I didn't see Mildred. Yeah, Pierce. she was critically okay. acclaimed. It was okay. Okay, well that's good. Yeah. But, I like her. You're right, yeah. though. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. I didn't mean to downplay what you were saying. But, but still, you're right. Yeah. I mean, but but yeah, I'm glad that she's been recognized at least. Yeah. Here's what happens with people like her. Once she does get that Oscar nomination or she does do something that people want to consider, they go back and they go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, she was great in that. Why is it taking so long? And, and then everybody's on board. And so that's why I say people like, the young kid in Nightcrawler, it would be nice for people to recognize him because... Riz Ahmed. Thank you. Riz Ahmed. Um, It would be nice to be, uh, for them to recognize him because then they no longer have to try to build a reputation. They already have a reputation. She's built a reputation. And I think people do recognize her as being great, but just never in that Oscar caliber level she just never she hasn't done a performance like that i've always liked her so Mm -hmm. that said anyway so that same year is brad pitt the curious case of benjamin buttons and and some people knock on him as an actor watch this movie yeah come on look at the movies that he's been in yeah i understand he's a he's a star he's a movie star you can't Hold that against him. Yeah. Watch this movie and it will all go away. Mm -hmm. And then Frank Langella and Frost Nixon, which he won the Tony for. Mm -hmm. And here's what I'll say about And Richard Jenkins for The Visitor, if you haven't seen it, see it. And then Sean Penn, who won, who would have been my vote uh, or my pick. Any other year, any one of these could have won. Anybody could have won. Mm -hmm. It just happened to be this is how it lined up. And it was Sean Penn's year again. This is his second Oscar. And the thing that I find interesting about Sean Penn and Milk is, I've said this before, if I did not know he was heterosexual in real life, I would not have questioned for a split second that he was really gay. Not for a split second. Mm -hmm. And he's playing a real life character, which is a running motif in the Oscars too. Mm -hmm. Real life characters uh, get Oscar notice. But when you watch the documentaries on Harvey Milk, Sean Penn did exactly like what all these great performances do. It's not an imitation. It's not a caricature. It's a interpretation of what the actor sees the person would be like in real life in these fictional situations. Mm -hmm. And I love this story and I love to tell it because apparently Sean Penn's friend saw the movie. I don't know who's 
what his friend's name was, um, and said, and called Sean Penn and said, hey, you're going to win your second Oscar. And Sean Penn was like, oh, okay. And he's like, you smile more in this film than you ever have in your whole career. So they're going to give you an Oscar because nobody knew you could really smile oh, this geez. much. Yeah, it's kind of funny. But <laughs> in the end, he won it. So there you go. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. All right. Well, I mean, we... Uh, you got to skip right to Daniel Day Lewis again if you're going. Yeah, you do. I mean, the other performances are great. They're they're fine, but in, yeah, if we're I had talking, to scroll down. Yeah, if we, if we're talking about stuff that sticks out, and then you go, wait a second. We talked about Daniel Day Lewis and My Left Foot. We've talked about Daniel Day Lewis and There Will Be Blood, and all of the other films in between. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking about Daniel Day Lewis and Lincoln. and Lincoln. There is nothing. Which one of these goes with each other? None of them. Yeah. And that's why we're talking about individ- exactly. these individually. Exactly. And I love to tell this story, too, that when I saw Lincoln, which was not one of my favorite movies of the year. Mine either. I have to rewatch it. I will give myself over to it again. But for whatever reason, didn't completely work for me. Mm-hmm. But that opening sequence, when you see or well, you hear Lincoln talking, well, you don't know it's Abraham Lincoln talking, mm-hmm. but you hear kind of like a, um, a voiceover. Yeah, and you see the two soldiers, and he's obviously talking to those two soldiers, but you don't see the person talking. I had no idea that was Daniel Day Lewis speaking mm-hmm. as Abraham Lincoln. No idea. And when it shoots around, the camera spins around, and you see it's Abraham Lincoln, and you see it's Daniel Day Lewis. It's I don't have a clue what he said for the next two minutes because I was so blown away that I could not recognize his voice. Yeah. Nothing about this performance is like anything else he's ever done before. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's, I mean, he didn't have to do that, but that's based in fact. I mean, th- there are descriptions of how Abraham Lincoln spoke, and that was one of the things. It was a higher, read in a higher register than Daniel Plainview, for, for example. So he decided to take that on and try to honor that and and be accurate in that way. So, I mean, that's... That that is that that's really respectable. Well, he didn't have to do that, and no, I don't know if anybody would have would have said anything bad about that. You know, I don't think that I don't know if that would have been a detriment to the movie if he would have just done a normal speaking voice. But he decided to, you know. Well, somebody sarcastically said on some uh, witty show, you know, where he's trying to be clever, the comedian or somebody said, well, how do we know that he was the greatest Abraham Lincoln? We don't know what he's, Abraham Lincoln sounded like. That might be true, but the point is, is that I now believe he sounds like that. Well, sure. Because of the way Daniel Day-Lewis yeah. pulls it off. Mm-hmm. And the whole way he, I don't know, I was convinced after that movie that Daniel Day-Lewis might not be human. <laughs> he's <laughs> Joke, an alien. Yeah, because there's, he... He takes on a whole nother skin. There's something really, it's almost off putting how great he is. Well, he takes it seriously, and it makes you think that, like, he loses a bit of himself when he decides. And do you know the history behind him and that role? I mean, there's, you know, there's a bunch of articles about that. Yeah, but, he didn't want to do it. Oh, not at all. Yeah. And he wrote a very nice, like, long letter to Steven Spielberg telling him why he didn't want to do it. And, you know, I think it was a couple of years later or whatever, certain things happened. Liam Neeson was supposed to play uh, Abraham Lincoln. Oh. And he dropped out. He probably had to shoot Taken 3 or something. I don't know. But <laughs> It's actually coming out, dude. I just saw I the know, poster. I, I saw the poster when I went to see Mockingjay. But, but anyway, so, so in, in like, like you've said in the past, I mean, it's things happen for a reason, and all of that happened for a reason so that Daniel Day-Lewis could play this role. For- now, my understanding is, is that it's not that he didn't want to play it because he didn't think it was worth his time. He thought that it was... It would take it up. It would be too much. It for would, him. yeah. He would just go into it so like deep. Like he knew his limits. Yeah, and he didn't want to push, push past what he thought were his limits. Well, he has said thank you over and over again to Spielberg for whatever convinced him to do it because you know he has his third Oscar. He's the only actor in Oscar history that has three best actor Oscars, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, Other people have three, but he has three best actor. And he has has publicly 
apologized on some kind of level for being wrong about not wanting to take this on originally. He's like, I'm so glad whatever Spielberg said to me convinced mm -hmm. me because in the end he was right. It was something I needed to do. And like I said, I'm not a big fan of this movie and I do want to see it again, but it's unbelievable what he does in this film. It's unbelievable. I think the film needs a focus that it doesn't have. I didn't know what the film was about. Was it about the 13th Amendment? Was it about Lincoln's life? What was it about? You don't it's really delve. It's a dry movie. It is. And it doesn't delve too far in. I saw a documentary on PBS a couple of weeks before it came out, which I found way more interesting. <laughs> well, you find things out about uh, Abraham Lincoln that I think should have been incorporated to make him more of a well-rounded person in the film. Mm -hmm. They kind of glossed over some subjects if they had called the movie the 13th amendment it would have been a better film for me because i would have known what i was getting i thought you were going to get not your typical bi biopic because it's daniel day lewis and mm -hmm. you know sally fields and steven spielberg and all these other people mm -hmm. but you do need somewhat of why is he doing what he's doing and why is he so mo motivated to do it? It's not there. It isn't his performance, mm -hmm. but as for script wise, it's not there for me or maybe the second time I watch it, you know, but I think you're right. It's dry. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. And then did you want to say anything about last year's winner, Matthew McConaughey? Uh, it's one of those ones where if anybody had said you know, 10 years ago to the general public that Matthew McConaughey will win an Oscar one year, pe people, one day, people would laugh at you, you know, because he wasn't, he's not been taken seriously as an actor. They'd say, oh, you mean the actor from Surfer Dude? Yeah, right. <laughs> or what's the other one you love to reference? The Oh, uh, uh, Sahara? No. Yeah, well, right. there's that one, and then there's like Ghost of Girlfriend's Past. Yeah, and, and the one with Kate ten Hudson. Ways to lose, yeah. 10 Days to Lose Your lover or yeah, something whatever it is yeah so unfortunately his career started to make some weird uh changes and choices but i remember him from a time to kill mm -hmm. and i go i i went who is this guy like there's something about him and even in dazed and confused yeah he's great he only had a couple of scenes but yeah he was you could see character driven performances yeah. that people were not seeing because he was taking roles there's the difference between being a great actor and being a working actor mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to work you just have to provide and make money and do the things that you have to do to maybe these are the things that he was offered and they are paychecks and he did the best that he could for what it was i'm not sure. you know discounting him for that but i was not as surprised as a lot of people were that he could do what he did in dallas buyers club mm -hmm. now that said he would not have been if i could have voted I would have voted for Leonardo Me DiCaprio. Me too, and that's what I was going to bring up. Yeah, because I, 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 I would have. I don't see. I mean, I know DiCaprio has been nominated. He was nominated for Blood Diamond, I think. Yep. And and I, what's eating Gilbert Grape? Blood yeah. Diamond. Um, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. We're forgetting one. There's another one in there. I, I can't think of what it is. I I think that the Wolf that Wolf of Wall Street is the movie should have been the movie for him to, to win on because of, because, well, once again, it's based on a, a real person, but it's not specifically, you know, word for word things that happened with that person. But the things that he went, went through and his ability to play the comedy and his ability to play the extreme emotions and still be, Believable. Believable. Yeah. Hard press. Yeah. See, everybody's heart went towards Matthew McConaughey, and the heart always wins in this category. Yeah. It always Look does. Look at him. He needs to eat some food. Yeah. Let's give him an yeah. Oscar. You and know? you know what? He is devastatingly beautiful in this movie as the character. And he did go through a rough ride, no pun intended, because, you know, he's you know, Mr. Bronco Bull rider guy. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. There's something about how wrong the performance could have been in The Wolf of Wall Street, how over the top and and just wrong. It could have gone so bad. Or but, it could have even been emotionless, you know, or it could have, I mean, it could have gone so many different ways. You're and right. And he pulls, he plays it so over the top, but holds it in so 
tightly. So for me, I'm glad Matthew McConaughey's win. I came out of Dallas Buyers Club, which was my favorite movie of the year mm-hmm. last year, and I said, if Matthew McConaughey wins, I'll be okay with that. You know, I, I of course, was way more blown away by way more blown away um, by Jared Leto than Matthew McConaughey. But mm-hmm. then I saw it a second time and you accept the fact that he's won and he's already won the Oscar by this point that I've seen it a second time. Mm-hmm. And the last scene where he starts to get sick again and he's in the middle of the road. Do you remember that scene? And Steve Zahn, um, uh, the cop. He gets, okay. Yeah. And, and he, he, he can't figure out where he's at and he gets out of the car and he's going one way and he's walking. It's, it's beautifully done. It's it's really well done. You know he's sick again. You know he's not going to recover from this point on. And it's the 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 vulnerability that he has is undeniable. So I'm not saying it's not going to be one of those years that I, under my breath, would say I'll give it a, give it back, Matthew. Give it back. You know, it's mm-hmm. not going to be that. But like we've just discussed, for me, it would have been Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, me too. We missed The Aviator. That's the one we missed. Mm. I would have never thought of it, but yep, that's it. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that brings us to this year. Now, I mean, we haven't seen all the movies, but who's the front runner? Keaton? Michael Keaton? Yes. Yes. Michael Keaton, Steve Carell, Jake Gyllenhaal. What's the young guy's name from the theory? Eddie Redmayne. And uh, Benjamin Cumberbatch. Is that his name? Benedict. Benedict. Thank you. Those are the possible five. Now, remember, there's always one that shows up. Um, uh, It could have been, this last year could have been considered Christian Bale, American Hustle. People were kind of considering him, but they weren't really considering him. And then he ended up getting the nomination but he's the one that I don't remember was in this category, even though I thought he was great in American Hustle. He was great, but I don't think of him as like the pinnacle of that movie, as as like the the person that the movie is is hung on. Even though I guess it is, but it's more of like I, I'm interested in all of the characters in that movie, as opposed to just his character. Absolutely, no doubt about it. But for this year coming up, I think it's Michael Keaton's Oscar to lose. That's what I think, and. I would love to see Birdman take everything. Well, I think it's going to take director. I mean, you, you think it's so? going to be hard to not unless there's always one that I shows up and you're like, "Wait." Because Un- Matt- unless Miller, unless Bennett Miller somehow for Foxcatcher. For Foxcatcher. It I haven't seen the movie, but but I I don't know. I mean, well, he he seems to do well with getting nominated for oh, Academy yeah. Awards. There's no doubt. He's probably going to be nominated yeah. because people are loving this film. And mm-hmm. by, by this time next week, we'll probably both will have seen yes, it. Yes, I hope but so. But for example, last year, Matthew McConaughey was sort of um, invincible. Mm-hmm. And then Wolf of Wall Street came out. And people went, oh, but wow, Leonardo DiCaprio is really great. And right before that, 12 Years a Slave came out and... Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor, mm-hmm. I believe that's how you that's say right. it. Um, everybody's like, "Wow, he's really great in that." And all of a sudden, everybody's like, "Wait, Matthew McConaughey? Maybe he doesn't. He's not a lock." Mm-hmm. So there's always this floating chance that he could not have won. And until Oscar night, he wasn't even sure. I mean, not that you're ever really going to be sure, but there's some people who are front runners who just you know are going to win. It's just the way it works out. Like um, Kate Blanchett this last year for Blue Jasmine. Everybody mm-hmm. knew she was going to win from day one. Yeah, yeah. That's we a whole still haven't talked about that movie. Yeah, we did a little bit, but not a whole lot. We did in Best Actress a little bit, um, but. You're never really sure until it happens who's going to win, but the front runner right now is Michael Keaton, yeah. and Alejandro Gonzalez in Uritu is definitely the front runner for best director, mm-hmm. and I, I think it's their Oscars to lose, and I'm fully behind it too. Oh yeah, you know I, I it's probably going to be my favorite movie of the year because I I can't every time somebody says oh well, it's yeah. Oscar season what's your favorite movie so far Birdman comes right out yeah. See, for me, I mean, I want to say that, but then, like, there's part of me that just wants everybody in the world to see Whiplash. And and I know it's not going to get up there, but... Yeah, there's 10 of them. Yeah. There's 10 nominations, well, so uh, it happens. I mean, I it will get seen because of J.K. Simmons, which is good, 
And that's all I can ask for, really. Well, you know? if this has any kind of consolation to it, it is on everybody's top 10 list and top five list of best films of this year, Whiplash. That's great. So First time director, right? Yeah. That's don't, great. Don't be surprised. These guys have a way of coming in and saying, hey, we're here, Beast of the Southern Wild, yep. the uh, gentleman from Amor. All of mm -hmm. these guys were not Oscar contenders on any level, and then boom, there they were. Mm -hmm. So there's a possibility that, what is the director's name of Whiplash? Damien Chazelle. Yeah, they show up, and you know, all of a sudden they're in a different level now because people now know their name. I, I now learn their name. Miles so. Teller, I listened to a, an, uh, an interview with him. He's already signed on for Damien Chazelle's next movie. Good. Which I guess has been scripted, but they haven't, you know, figured out where it's going to shoot and all that stuff. Well, we, stuff. we've been talking about him before we did the podcast, a couple of different movies. We're like, who's that guy? Oh yeah, that's mm -hmm. My Miles Teller's, what's his name? You know, um, the, um... He was in the one with Shailene Woodley. Yes, what was that called? Which is called Spectacular Now. Yeah, very good. Um, we've, we've liked him for a long time. Now he's elevated to a certain level where he no longer probably has to look for work. work well, is, and he's going to be Mr. Fantastic. Too, yeah, so that's well, help. we'll see how that goes, though. That's going to be, that could go poorly. We'll, well, we'll see. They're going to go with a younger reboot. We'll see. Who knows? It could work. It possibly will work. Who knows? They can't seem to get certain comic book characters right on film. That's one of them that they can't seem to get yeah. exactly right. Um, not just Mr. Fantastic, but the Fantastic Four. The first two films are okay. They're not great. I didn't see either one. No. Anyway, he's going to make more money because of that. That's true. So, and he'll be able to do these other movies. Exactly. Hopefully. So that's it. But he's now on a different level because of this film and because of J.K. Simmons and the director and the film. So for that reason alone, I think the film will win, like meaning it's winning. Might not get nominated for Best Picture. He might not get nominated for Best Actor. But what you get out of it, mm -hmm. those nominations in the long run probably, yeah, sure. Do you want to be nominated? Absolutely. Do you yeah. want to win? Absolutely. Yeah, duh. Uh -huh. It's the greatest award of your profession. Mm -hmm. Of course you want to be recognized for that. But what the other things that happen because you are in that caliber now, you know, I think uh, – um, Channing Tatum is going to be looked at in a different light after Foxcatcher. Steve Carell is going to be looked at yep. in a different light after Foxcatcher. So forth and so on. So we'll see. But I think it's Michael Keaton's Oscar to lose. We'll see. All right. Sounds good. Well, it sounds like that's a good place to, to end our discussion on Best Actors or Best Actor uh, Academy Award winners and nominees. Okay. If you want to check us out on the web, our web mail. Nope. Not web mail. Our web page is actorandengineer.com. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash actorandengineer. And on Twitter, we're at actorengineer. So we'll see you next week. Until then. Bye. Bye.